we have there's we have more people coming in. This is a great crowd today. This is awesome. A testament to Karen. <laughs> There's one there, there's one, there's a couple more here. Yeah, there's one there too. When it spills out into the next room, that's always a good sign here. <laughs> Well, I'll just say welcome to everybody. Um, this is a beautiful day, so I'm glad everybody was uh, happy to come today. You probably had other options, but um, I think our guest speaker is a sufficient attraction. Um, I'm Dick Pullman. For those of you who have not been here uh, on the uh, lunch series that I have every semester, uh, this is the first one of this semester. Uh, uh, thanks to the Writer's House again, and also this is called the, the Sylvia Cotter's Lunch Series. Um, I have three speakers this semester, the first one I will introduce in a moment, um, and there's two others coming up that I'll just briefly mention. Um, both of the other speakers uh, are tied to the fact that we have a, uh, a presidential election coming up next year, so they're, they're both political, political subjects, uh, political guests, I should say. Um, on November 9th, and this is actually a 6 p.m. event, not, not, not lunch, but it's 6 p.m. on November 9th. Uh, I'm going to be hosting here uh, what I, who, uh, someone who I think has actually has written, I think in some ways, one of the greatest political books uh, ever written, uh, named Richard Ben Kramer, uh, who was uh, formerly a legend at the Philadelphia Inquirer and, and now is maybe perhaps better not best known as a biographer of uh, Joe DiMaggio and certain baseball and political figures. But he wrote a he wrote a political he wrote a political book called What It Takes. Uh, yes, it's about over a thousand pages long, uh, but but by many, in fact, politi the Politico website uh, recently did a feature on him, uh, calling it uh, you know the greatest political book since uh, the making of the president uh, 50 years ago, uh, and it, it's tough to get him to come speak, and it's taken me like close to a year of uh, very sporadic emails, mostly uh, with his significant other, uh, to get him to come up from Maryland uh, to uh, to speak here, but he is going to come speak here. Uh, talk a lot, I think, also about how politics has changed, uh, uh, presidential politics and the media have changed uh, since he wrote the book close to 20 years ago. Um, one week after that, November 16th, uh, all right, so November 9th, that's a Wednesday at 6 p.m. November 16th, also uh, a Wednesday at noon, um, uh, a um, former colleague of mine from the campaign trail named Jill Lawrence, uh, who used to be the USA Today chief political writer, and now she's uh, writing on the web, uh, part of the, the way the gestalt these days, and she writes for the Daily Beast and a number of other websites. Uh, and she's covering the uh, Republican presidential race. She's on the campaign trail all the time. And um, she's going to come here and report on what's going on and uh, probably talk about how she's, probably made, uh, how she's made the transition from being a print reporter to uh, working on the web and how that's changing the media and how that's changing politics. Um, which brings us to today. Um, this is uh, obviously a, a, a personal honor of mine. I'll have to, uh, full disclosure, uh, Karen and I have known each other for now a quarter of a century, uh, older than many of the people in this room. Uh, <laughs> I don't mind saying. Um, uh, Karen came to the Philadelphia Inquirer 25 years ago in uh, 1986. Uh, she's, I think, best known now for her Metro column, which appears on page two, uh, Wendy's, uh, excuse me, Wendy, Wednesdays and Sundays. Uh, writing mostly about uh, uh, the metro area and the, uh, the uh, fiscal crisis in Philadelphia and all the characters involved. Um, but previously before that, I mean, one of the things I think that her, her history is interesting is she's written for a lot of national magazines. She's covered popular culture, uh, social issues. She's written profiles of, as, uh, as her bio says, the celebrities and uh, both, uh, both celebrities and the unsung. Uh, and... Um, and as she is uh, willing to note, she's also worked in the past for two newspapers that are now defunct and takes responsibility for closing neither of them. Uh, and uh, I think most importantly also, she was recently a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in commentary. And uh, being a finalist to me, is that's winning as far as I'm concerned. So, <laughs> so with that, let me introduce Karen Heller. Hi, thank, thank you. Can you hear me? 
This is really impressive because it's beautiful. I, I'm, I'm really flattered. Thank you so much. And maybe it's the food, but I appreciate you all coming out. And um, Dick told me the format. Here, I'll just throw this here. Dick said that he wants me to talk to you for about 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, before we open up for questions, I want to say, because I always get a question, I don't write about Israel. I've never written about Israel, and uh, that's the editorial board, so I just want to say that. <laughs> um, anyway, I wanted to um, share with you some of the joys and uh, not so much of the joys of our business in transition. And as, uh, as Dick mentioned, w I've been doing this for an awfully long time, and uh, the good news is that I've done it during the best of times, and unfortunately... <laughs> Now we're in the queasiest times, but I want to say to the younger people here, uh, if you love it, you should continue to do it because I'm convinced that uh, somebody smarter than I am is going to figure this out, and by the time you're ready, they'll fix it. <laughs> I, I, I think we've done the hard work of suffering through the, um, the really queasy times, and I, I, I just feel that it has to go up from here. I'm an optimist, or I would have given up a long time ago. Um, I wanted to give a few inspirational readings to, um, just because I'm that kind of a person, um, because my job is so glamorous, I received this email this morning. I have access to seven pictures that show proof of the past existence of extraterrestrial life. <laughs> on another planet. I will respond to questions. Please read below. These pictures are, as of this very moment, going out to bed. Again, this is not a hoax. Um, I have sent this to very important publications. Please, I'm not ignorant of what they are worth. <laughs> Kim Kardashian wedding photos fetch 1.5 million. Please, don't insult me. Okay, that was, I got that today. I have not making a bid yet, but if you, uh, I, I love it on another planet, you know, as opposed to here. Um, this is inspirational whenever I get really uh, sad about my work. I, I'm going to read you this quote. Uh, this is uh, from a profile in the New York Times of uh, Julian Fellows, who writes for the BBC, uh, writes uh, Downton Abbey, which was on uh, Masterpiece Theater, and he also uh, won an Oscar late in life uh, for Gosford Park. And he, uh, his father gave him this advice. If you have the misfortune to be born into a generation which must earn its living, you might as well do something amusing. <laughs> so this, that is my inspiration. And then just to let you know um, really how wonderful it is to work in journalism these days, um, here is an email that I received yesterday. Ageism, sexism, misogynist insults, and poor writing, all in one column. You should be ashamed of yourself, Karen. <laughs> That's why we do it, for the love, right? <laughs> anyway, um, I'm just going to share a little bit. I don't know how many of you read The Inquirer. I hope you read The Inquirer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some young people, please. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> It's on philly.com, too. You can read that, too. Um, okay. Uh, last fall, the new owner of the Inquirer and Daily News, or rather owners, it's a consortium of warm and fuzzy hedge fund investment groups, <laughs> named yet another new editor of the Inquirer. For those of you keeping track at home, that's three owners and five editors in 10 years. Like I said, they're going to get this fixed, okay? Because it's like a puppy. We keep getting these new editors, and you have to house train them and break them in. <laughs> Uh, this makes life a bit scary and unpredictable, not always in a good way. This has a dizzying effect um, that on many days I forget whom I'm supposed to suck up to. <laughs> As a former colleague once said, you finally get this boss house trained to your liking and then they bring a new dog in. So you can call journalism all kinds of things, but static and dull are not two of them. I have been doing this as awfully long time as Dick mentioned. I mean obscenely long. It just happens to be that I'm aging particularly well. This demonstrates a remarkable lack of creativity and a resistance to risk and change coupled with monumental inertia. But the sad truth is I don't have any other marketable skills, and I love what I do. I've been, I've been fortunate to be paid to do what I love, which I tell the young people in this room and even the not-so-young people in this room that is really a gift. And on the days when I say, oh my God, I get emails insulting me like five different ways in two sentences, I still get paid to do what I love, and that person most likely doesn't. <laughs> so 
as I said before, I've been employed during the great years, what I call the crack years of journalism, when they used to yell at us for not making 18% profit. Now, for the young people in this room, there really was a time when you could have 18% profit on your investment. I know this sounds ridiculous, but it was true. Anyway, uh, in those years, we sent people like Dick to London. Uh, they sent me to Iowa. Why? Because I wanted to cover the Iowa State Fair. Um, we just had so much gobs of money, it was ridiculous. We were like, we were drunk on money. We loved it, and we should have appreciated it more. And, and now, uh, we don't have money. <laughs> and um, we've taken pay cuts, and we've had people leave through buyouts, um, but we've never had more readers. So this is an interesting conundrum. We hit 100 million readers on our website in September. Now, they may be looking at Naked Philly Bike Race, but they're, um, <laughs> which would not be my choice to put on our website, but it's there. Or, you know, wing bowl photos, which would not be my choice. But it also means that we're getting more people reading us, which is, I mean, it also helped that the Phillies were really good. Um, you know, that's good. You know, so one of my solutions to how to fix journalism is to have winning teams. It really could. Because, and here's another thing that you may not have figured out. Um, people who grow up in a city, when they move, they stay fans of those teams forever. It, it's really something nobody figured this out. So we have all these great people who left Philadelphia but still are religious when it comes to the Eagles and the Phillies and the Sixers and the Flyers. And when they're all playing, like right now, well, the Sixers aren't, but everyone else, and the Phillies aren't, unfortunately. But, but when they were, for that brief moment that three teams were playing, and you know, seemingly, well, two of them were playing well and one was playing badly. But anyway, the traffic went way up. It actually doesn't matter if the Eagles are bad. Every, the traffic just moves. So that is one of the great things about the internet. If somebody is, cares about what you're writing about, um, they will continue to follow you. So that's really great. Every day, anyway, we are bombarded with stories and newsletters and websites and handouts and literature to say nothing of catalogs and spam, begging to be read. In turn, they compete with thousands of images and videos, stories without words, that are often more valued, rightly or wrongly, in our intensely visual world. And our job as creators of those stories and newsletters is to get them to read us. We're information architects trying to attract and retain an overtaxed audience, getting their eyes to rest and brains engage on our work. Within my newspaper alone, about 100 stories are published daily, all asking to be read. Competition can exist within a single company or com um, publication. And if we can't get our work read, noticed, then all we've manufactured is trash. We've failed. We've worked hard to create drive-by verbiage. You can work on something for minutes or days, but if the end result is to be ignored, what difference have you made? And how meaningless does that word become? Your work becomes a verbal treadmill, a lot of sweat to go nowhere without the fat burn or a single muscle tone. Our goal, above all else, is to be read, to be understood, to communicate information, ideas, and opinions clearly and successfully. I like to pay our readers the compliment of intelligence. If you treat your readers like idiots, you get idiots for readers. <laughs> Maybe it's just me, but I'd rather write for smart people. Smart writing is like being in a popular, good-looking restaurant. You just feel better for being there. I've had readers tell me that I've sent them to the dictionary. They've even thanked me for doing so. What was I saying about smart people? Not all our readers are smart, and many of them are downright mean. Um, I referred to what I just did. <laughs> I have many more of those, by the way. You know, if you ever, you ever really worry that you're getting overly confident, you can just read the comments on our website. But um, the internet has allowed very nasty people the privilege of anonymity to tell strangers the sort of things they would never say to friends and relatives. And unfortunately now, I'm going to complain for a minute, there are four ways for readers to gripe about our work. Email, voicemail, letters to the editors, and posted comments at the end of our online version. Many of these readers never miss the opportunity to use every possible venue, and whoever gets their first rules. If it's a jerk, then they, the, that abuse generally sets the tone for the rest of the comments. My editors generally stop me from going there, so I don't dr begin to drown in a puddle of self-loathing. If I could change anything, I would change that. Other news sites hide comments or pay 12-year-olds somewhere to screen out the nasty bits. And I still curse the former editor whose one good idea during his blissfully brief tenure was to post our phone numbers at the end of the articles. 
this is such a bad idea. <laughs> I have never gotten a single good story idea from that phone number. Anyway, many has been the time when I've wished to put his phone number. I, I do have that fantasy. In my last story, I'm going to put Walker Lundy's phone number in North Carolina and have him take the call. Anyway, but the best writers generally take uh, criticism fairly well, provided it's coming from people they respect. Um, they, want, they know they want to get better and that there's always room for improvement. And this is no job for sissies, none at all. It can take its toll. I don't particularly like getting yelled at on a regular basis, uh, particularly by Ed Rendell. Um, Ed Rendell, when he was governor, um, used to call me on a fairly regular basis, which was amazing to me. I mean, he would call me, and they'd say, hold for the governor, and I'd call him back, and or whatever, and he'd say, Karen, you're a very brave woman. And then he would start to yell at me. <laughs> And it's like, I don't, you know, pay me enough for this, and now I've taken a pay cut for this. But at the end of this, when he would do this, and the mayor has done this too, I would stop and I would say to the governor, then governor, governor, don't you have something better to do, like run the state? I mean, you know, but, but then you thought in a way, well, maybe we still matter. You know, so for all those people like dead tree media, mainstream, lamestream media, all those really cute, clever generation. I mean, I don't want to get into a generational war. I like young people. I love them. And I love talking to them. I love meeting with them. I love hearing that they're reading. I love them writing. I love it all. I don't want to get into a war. But I think that that says something that we can still get under the skins of powerful people. And I, you may have heard this before, that one of the mantras of journalism is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable, right? I mean, really, in a way, because this is serious stuff. If we don't, we're the gatekeepers. If we don't check them on bad behavior, on misguided um, policies, on really wrong decisions, who will? I mean, who will? Who will speak up for the voters and the taxpayers who says this is, you know, criminal what you are doing when you cut education funding to the city of Philadelphia because you, you didn't get, you only got 30% of the vote, which is what I suspect is going on in Harrisburg. That is criminal. And who else is going to call Corbett on this? So I do that on a regular basis. And they pay me for that. So, I mean, you know, that is one of our jobs. When people ask me what are the remaining pleasures or what are the great pleasures of this job, and part of it to me is being a perpetual student. All of you who are still in school, I'm incredibly jealous. If I could do anything, I'd come back with you. I would love to be, you know, just sucking up, being a Hoover of all this information. You know what a Hoover is? That's the vacuum cleaner, by the way. <laughs> At the stop, you may never have vacuumed in your life. I try not to, but anyway, Hoover, uh, you might want to, um, you know, just to suck up all this information, new ideas, exchange of all that, and I love that about my job. If I would tell young people, you, you know, just, you know, it's like that, stay hungry, my friend. You know, you need to just be interested, and unlike Dick, who has just enormous passion and deep pockets of intense, you know, chasms of knowledge about politics, as well as baseball and Nazis, I mean, <laughs> really... Uh, I mean, those are, his, and Woody Allen, those are like his favorite subjects, you know? But anyway, um, I am not that smart. And my great thing about my job is that I can be a polymath and I can just flit around. I would say I'm a great person at a cocktail party because I can talk about anything for 10 minutes. But, but when I do write about something, I really do kind of just take a crash course on literacy. Like, I'm, I'm planning to meet with the mayor's literacy chief this week. I mean, it was great. This morning I got in and I said, you know what, we have an enormous literacy problem in this city. It's huge, and it's really, you know, I'm always writing about poverty because, as you may or may not know, Philadelphia is the poorest large city in America. In other words, it isn't, that's wrong. That's the, I put that incorrectly. I'm sorry. I'll correct myself. It is the highest percentage of poor people in the city. It is not the poorest city. Actually, our finances are relatively good. But we have the highest percentage of poor people in the city, and it is, it is going to suck the economy down if we don't do anything about these people, and they need to know how to read. If they cannot read, nothing will change, and many of them cannot. A frightening number of them cannot. So this morning I was thinking about that, and I shot off an email to the mayor's chief of literacy, and it was like, I would love to talk to you, she says, and I'm meeting her Wednesday. I mean, that's what's great about my job. And now I get to talk substantively about something that's really important that you may not be thinking about because you're all literate, smart people, but that that is actually not going to, you know, because people, why is literacy important? People who can read make more money. People who make more money pay more taxes. More taxes makes the city healthy. And it means that we don't have to pay for social services as much. 
generally our crime rate will go down. All of these things are positive, correct? So we need to bring the literacy rate up. So it, I love thinking about these big issues, and then I have a small amount of space to write about them. I love getting paid to be nosy. I get to go into people's homes. I get to go to people's big, beautiful homes, and I get people's kind of really not so great homes and see how other people live. I get to ask the hard questions. I get to ask questions you're all too polite to ask. I get to ask them, and they pay me to do that. It's kind of great. Um, Brian Wilson, does anybody know who Brian? Do, do, okay, Brian Wilson's the Beach Boys, okay? And Brian Wilson was a genius, a brilliant musical genius, and then he baked his brain with many drugs, okay? This is a fact. And I went to interview uh, a Brian Wilson when he nodded out on me six times. This has never happened. And he was under, I mean, it should probably, you'd be surprised, but it's only the first time it's ever happened. But anyway, he, um, I was, I was sitting there, and I had read about this guy named uh, Landy, uh, I forget his first name, but he, he was this, sort of this guru faux doctor who, Brian Wilson, his guru, and he'd fallen under the sway of this guy, and he was there. And he was ho overly medicated, and I was dying to find out what medications he was on. And so I asked him. I mean, I just thought, what the hell? I'm going to ask him. He brought out, I mean, the whole table was covered with drugs. And it was frightening. And then I called a you know, pharmacologist, a psychopharmacologist, and said, oh my god, anyone would pass out with those. That, you know, that's just a cocktail for narcolepsy right there. So I got to ask those questions. And people said, you really did? I said, yeah, I really asked him. You know, you don't know. And he brings all the drugs out for me. So um, I get to ask about people's drug habits, you know, OK? <laughs> Um, I mean, I've been in Greaterford Prison interviewing the, the guy who was in prison longer than anybody, I think, in the country, but certainly in the state of Pennsylvania. He's been there 57 years. He was arrested at 15, and he's going to die there, all right? I mean, and I've interviewed these famous people. I've had Zsa, Zsa Gabor spit on me. I've had Ed Rendell yell at me. You know, I've gone, you know, fishing with James Michener. I mean, you know, I've had all these incredible experiences. So, and to me, what is life but a series of adventures? So that's all the stuff that I love. Um, Growing pleasures are, are more people reading me on the internet. It's easier to do research, find people, uh, find out about them. I love, I was a history major. I, I love doing research. I, Dick was like the king. In the old days, we would have these FedEx contests, which Dick and uh, another woman who's sadly not with us anymore fundraiser. So they would have FedEx contests in the morning. There would just be boxes and boxes of FedEx information on their desks. And um, now we can look that all up, you know. Uh, we. We get to do research and, and learn about things. Uh, I, we get to blog and tweet, and we're able to share new uh, discoveries and reach people um, quicker and more different kinds of people. It's great, OK? So diminishing pleasures. What is less uh, pleasant? Uh, diminishing paycheck. <laughs> That's not fun. Uh, I don't think there's enough age diversity in our newsroom. We don't, when we say young people and our young people are 32, that's not good enough. We need younger people and we need to be hiring more of them. We need more racial diversity and ethnic diversity in our newsroom and I'm sorry to say that we don't have enough of that. Uh, we're not nurturing and attracting more talent. And I don't just mean by young people, but also people who can speak Chinese, or people who can speak Arabic, or people who've traveled the world or know a lot about science and technology that we need to know about. Young people in the room, if you ask me where, where growth is going to be in journalism, it's going to be in technology writing, it's going to be in science writing, it's going to be in understanding other cultures, and it's going to be able to speak particularly in the Arab world and China and Korea, I would add, and Vietnam. But these are, this to me, these are all assets. Any one of you who's got that, you're ahead of the game. And if you don't, when people say should major in journalism, I know you can really only kind of minor here, but I would say go take some technology classes, science classes, pick up Arabic, Chinese, whatever you can. But this is all really um, where it's strength and we need it. Um, so I, I worry most of all about our fear of risk and our commitment to uh, taking time to investigate things. Uh, I think it was Richard Van who's coming in here. He's the one who spent the year on the White Rhino, or was it Mike, Mark right. Baden? We had a reporter spend a year on the White Rhino. Now, some of our indulgences were probably kind of foolhardy. But on the other hand, we've had people spend a year on a project, and maybe it hasn't come to anything. But the fact was that you don't always know what you're going to get. And, and I, I'm sorry we don't have that time that to really look at it. I, I worry that this is a great time for corporate and municipal <laughs> malfeasance. And where we don't have the wherewithal to have enough people investigating it. Uh, we need more of those people. And I, you know, fortunately, some of the nonprofits and foundations are starting to fund independent journalism projects filled with really wonderful, remarkably hardworking people. But we're not doing enough of our paper. We used to have teams and teams of investigative reporters. Now we only have a few. 
Um, as I said, I can't stand the commenters. Um, I have thick skin, but only up to a point. I'd like praised. I don't get it. Um, I, it's sort of like spray painting, and uh, you know, to me, whoever gets there first, as I said, it's um, whatever. I don't like having my phone number in the paper, and um, <laughs> and uh, I I don't like that ever. You know, it's easy to blame the internet, but I'm gonna. I'm going to blame them anyway. But um, <laughs> um, so I want to open it up to questions, and um, I will answer almost everything. I'm pretty honest. Yes? I want to remind you we have the flyers. Yes, I did mention the flyers. I did. I did. <laughs> They're doing well. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't. I, don't. I won't slime your flyers. I'm <laughs> OK, the union. I'm sorry. OK. See, there you go. Uh, everyone's a critic. OK, see? <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. Where's okay. The, and the women's yeah. soccer team. Okay. That's yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, also, before your meeting on Wednesday, um, I have a hot tip if you want one. Um, class wars like food and brew. Okay. Um, I was shocked the other day when I came home and turned on the television to see revolutions going on all over the world. I don't know if this is off topic. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been following New York, and I lost sight of what's happening everywhere in Philadelphia as well. Right. Um, well, I, I have to say that I, I apologize. Um, to me, like I said, I like to be a polymath. I don't, I haven't been following, I mean, I know what about Egypt. I, you know, Calvin Trillin famously did this column about how he gave his wife Poland for Christmas because he couldn't worry about more than three countries at once. And we do have something, you know, we, there's really a term called empathy overload. So, so I apologize that I don't follow all of these hot spots. Um, I'm aware, you know, there's a huge economic crisis that's looming in, in uh, Europe. And also, of course, we know that there's um, censorship and crackdown in the Arab world as well. And that what looks successful to us is not necessarily as successful in those countries. I, I also am afraid to say we have no journalists overseas when we once had seven or eight, at the, including Dick, on our paper, and that really that has fallen mostly to the New York Times. Uh, the Washington Post and the LA Times have some. But the great news is that um, I am not a fan of CNN, by the way, but I, I think it's, it's a, a lousy excuse for a network. They, they ought to be ashamed of how poor their programming is. But I do think that on the Internet, there, there is a, 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 an extraordinary amount of information that, that you know, because, unfortunately, we, we can't afford these staffs. It's an enormous investment of time. But if you are interested in a country, um, you know, when the Rupert Murdoch scandal was breaking, which I could not read enough about, um, I was able to just you know, with a click, go to the um, Independent and Guardian in London. And uh, the Guardian did the best job in the world of covering the Murdoch scandal. They were ahead of it. So, so um, the answer is I don't know enough about this, and I apologize. But uh, no, I no, I don't predict. <laughs> I, I lose on predictions. <laughs> yes. Yeah, she did leave. Um, no, she won't be replaced. Um, Carrie has gotten a contract, though. Uh, we had, um, unfortunately, what uh, newspapers do is, um, well, I don't know, they, they're allegedly smarter than we are, but every time they think that they can save money, they reduce the staff. So we just had another buyout, and they asked eight people in the union and f five people outside of the union to take buyouts, and with each buyout, and Dick took one of them, didn't you? Did you take one? Oh, you just left. Uh, they, wouldn't pay they, they wouldn't pay you to leave, right? <laughs> they know, well, they didn't want you to leave, Dick. But with um, they, they offered uh, 40 weeks pay, uh, which is a voluntary severance agreement in a union, and a certain amount of money and three week, three months health insurance, which isn't, which is lousy. But if you're married and have a spouse with or uh, with uh, good health insurance, or you're old enough and you go into social, but anyway. Um, so Carrie just decided she'd had enough. She'd been there 25 years. And she wanted to try longer form journalism. She found, and, and it, this everyone is different, but I can't speak for her because I've talked a lot to, uh, with her about this. 
she felt that the demands of her time were getting greater and greater and she wasn't able to focus on the quality of the work. They wanted her to blog, they wanted her to do this feature we have on A2 called In the Know. When we interview people, it fills the space, but it's a Q&A, it has to be recorded and edited. She felt, you know, they wanted her to blog, they wanted her to do video, which none of us have really been trained very well to do, and then we do it and they say, you're really bad at it. And I, I like they did this for a while. One of their great ideas was to have a television show, were you there for that? And they threw me up there like, you know, like spaghetti on a wall. They gave me no training. I was producing segments and there's a reason I went into print. I didn't have to worry about how I looked like, okay? So they put, I had to produce segments. I'm writing scripts. I'm getting film crews out. And then the head of this guy, the, the guy they hired for three minutes, said, you know, you're not very good at this. And I was like, <laughs> I can write, you know? But really. So she just, felt, she just felt they wanted all of this. And meanwhile, you know, she pointed out in her piece yesterday that when she first came here there were 160 I forget the number and now they're like 500 yeah and and you have to review all this and meanwhile you're reviewing a lot of garbage right and and I've always hated what they do to her work and Stevens in the weekend section they chop it up and it jumps and it jumps and it jumps it's not the greatest display I mean I have great display and um, I think she just had it and she said you know what I'm going to try longer she's going to she is going to be on contract she's going to write a review a week uh, so Stephen doesn't well, curl up in a fetal position, you know, from all the work. Uh, but she's not going to be replaced. And John Storm also took the buyout, and he is not being replaced. I mean, uh, David Hilbrand will now be the television critic. But they just have been there. But on the other hand, it is like a garden. I mean, with any luck, it'll be a garden. At some point, I'm hoping they will hire some young people, which is what we need to have reviewing some of these things. But... At this point, you know, you do something a certain amount of time, and if you feel you're getting to the point where you're bitter and unhappy and you can afford to move on, I commend them. I think it's a very brave thing she did. You know, I'm, I'm in awe. I, I'm not that brave. But, and I, I also need the money. But, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, so that's what, that's what happened. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned kind of being excited about reaching people in a new way as they move forward with your mm -hmm. Oh, no, I, I, I'm sorry. If I said that, then I didn't express myself clearly. I think there's great substance in the Internet. I, I, CNN I have a problem with. But um, uh, I, I think there's a great amount of substance. The problem is can you reach people? I mean, there, uh, there, are no, there are people I know who are writing wonderful columns and terrific blogs, and I don't think they're getting a lot of readers. And, and there's this thing called a Sunday painter or a journal writer. And, and, you know, we all know people who paint for their own pleasure. They write poetry for themselves. They write journals for themselves. And they're fine with that. And if that is your feeling in life, bless you. You know, that's great. I'm not that person. I like to reach people. I, I like to feel that my words and my hard work count. And, you know, I'm sure Dick does too. So the problem is that there's a lot of good work, but is it being read? Do you know what I mean? At one point they said, like, what, one in every nine people had a blog. You know, that shouldn't happen, right? That shouldn't happen because a lot of them don't have much to say, you know? And it's like the tweeting, you know? When people first got Twitter, oh, my God, I, I'm going to the grocery store. I'm in the grocery store. I can't find the milk. I mean, it's not interesting. It's not interesting, you know, really. I mean, you know, it, it's sort of been um, kind of uh, just uh, opened up a whole great world of narcissism, you know? And, um, and I hope, but I do think there are plenty of people who have great things to say. Dick's blog is great. There, you know, but I also, we have a friend, I won't name him, who left the paper who writes a terrific blog. I don't think anybody reads it, you know, anybody. And he works very hard on it. And that's a choice he made. Uh, you know, he voluntarily left the paper, but, but I, and, you know, maybe he like, likes the freedom, but I would want the readers as well as the freedom. And in a weird way, we have a lot of freedom on the internet because no one's editing it, you know. I mean, we're not allowed to slime people we have to represent, and we do. I mean, I really never write anything that would embarrass, you know, you need to be responsible, but um, no, I think there's great stuff. It's just, can you make a living? You know, so then you end up like getting a do you know day job or whatever to support this. And how do you find those readers with so much? You know, this is just this enormous, enormous amount. And I feel like we're in this infancy with all technology. It's all so new. You know how when you first got your phone? I don't know. My daughter, I have two teenagers, so you can feel sorry for me. I have two teenagers, and my daughter first got her uh, phone bill. We, didn't, we stupidly did not get her unlimited texting, okay? And the, and, the, and the phone bill came the first month she had it, and, and it wasn't, I said, this isn't a number, this is a year, okay? <laughs> she had texted 1,928. I said, you're a depression, right? You know, perfect for our bill, right? But she, or a year before, but, but she, do you know what I mean? So people are all, in, they're just like intoxicated with this technology, but I don't know 
if they're using it, I think we're going to get smarter about it. Do you know what I mean? As we, uh, you know, the whole idea that I can take photos at the same quality as our photographers is nonsense. So I hope we'll get smarter and defer to the people who know best. But I think right now we're like, oh, you know, we're like drug addicts with the technology. So, no, I think there are lots of really good things on the Internet. In fact, I could do that or I can write, but, you know, whatever. Yes. unmarked grave for 50 years was recently given a traditional ethnic mm -hmm. stone that goes back to 9th century. And uh, the five clergy, or the clergy comprised of the churches of that ethnic group, presided. It was a fabulous uh, function, very moving. And uh, nobody at the Inquirer gave a damn. Now, it wasn't a, apparently it wasn't a Civil War story to the Inquirer. Apparently it wasn't a human interest story. Well, first of all, let, well, I wouldn't know. No? Well, first of all, let me say I'm sorry, and I, I understand and I hear in your voice that you're upset, and I apologize about that. But I will also say, as I said before, uh, look, I'm not the person making the decisions, but I want to say this to you. We have a smaller staff, and we have a lot of people who want coverage, and not every decision that's made. I, I can't. I can't qualify because I'm not the person. I'm not. I'm not going to defend or explain other people's My behavior. Question. Wait, wait, wait. Let me answer. I've listened to you. Okay. We cannot cover every single thing, and we cannot cover every moment. And you have to also understand this: the dead are all among us. There are men. The dead. Let me let me finish. There are dead people who need to be commemorated, but there are many, many, many dead people. And the fact is that we also have to cover the living. All right. So, so decisions are made, and they are not always to everyone's liking. There are plenty of things that appear in the paper that I think are a waste of space. And sometimes people come to me, and it breaks my heart. Okay, it breaks my heart that I can't. But for example, there are a lot of charities. I could turn my entire column over to every charity in this group, and you wouldn't in this city, in this region, and you wouldn't read it. You would stop reading my column. It has nothing to do with what you said. But I want to tell you, we make these decisions every day, or other people do, and they're not always the right ones. And I'm sorry for your hurt, but do you see what I'm? But but we have. A, I well, it depends on the editor and affecting that person that day and the whims. And I agree with you. I think we cover the Civil War too much. I again, sir. I I, I you know. No, I'm not saying that. You're making assumptions. Well, all right, we'll move on. Yes, you had a question. Um, in terms of um, the process for you to create a column, what's sort of the timeline that you're given? Uh -huh. And how do you um, sort of look at a topic? Do you talk to the group before that you're covering something? Do you do your own independent research? What are the sort of things you do to create that some idea? Oh, oh that's a great question. Um, I do both, okay? So a lot of it is what news is in the realm. Uh, some days I have nothing, <laughs> and I'm sort of hunting around. Other days, you know, there's just something that's so in my face I have to do it. I always, always, always go to the beat reporter. It's almost never that I don't because they know more than I do. Like I said, I, I sort of start from nothing. I like, I'm, I'm grateful they're so kind, my colleagues. They'll often back read my stuff for factual. We have far fewer copy editors, which has been really scary. You know, some of our stories are read without any copy editing. It's really frightening. So I have great colleagues who will often read and say, oh, you forgot this or add that or, you know, that changed. Um, so, you know, some things are obvious to me to cover. Other things, people will come to me and say, you know, I think this would be a great idea. In terms of lead time, I don't have a lot of lead time. I write twice a week. Um, I write, I'm generally on deadlines on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, you know, writing, f uh, I'm sorry, Fridays and Tuesdays. I write for the Sunday paper and the Wednesday paper. Um, you know, and I'm writing the day before. So, you know, I'm often thinking of things. Sometimes I, the ideas fall through. Sometimes, um, you know, you have a column that's really not that great. You know, you go out and cover something and there's not much there. You either have to trash it or you have to say, all right, I'm going to go with it. But I know it's not my greatest idea. Um, readers give us ideas. Sometimes they're extraterrestrial photographs. But... <laughs> Um, uh, sometimes they're very good ideas. Um, you know, sometimes they're very so, um, you know, 
you know, they want, again, they, they may want the coverage, and I don't think, my, my goal is to open the aperture and to try to reach as many people as I can. Um, and sometimes if you read some, write something, like we had someone uh, write us her family business had gone bankrupt, and uh, the records were destroyed, and now the city was coming after them for back taxes in the 70s. And I went, oh my God, this is gonna be three weeks of work. She may not be telling the truth, and how many people does this affect? How many people have back taxes, you know, they're coming for, for a bankrupt company, and do I know any of this? Do you know what I mean? It's only her word. I, I said no, because I just didn't think that was going to be of interest to a lot of people. So I, I don't really want to get into the troubleshooting. You know, I, I, I wasted once a week on a woman who claimed that a building next to her was crushing her building, and, and I found out that, Unfortunately, the building had done everything, the zoning, whatever, had done everything right. It didn't make her situation any better, but do you know what I mean? So I, I sort of weigh what, what will have a, not always the biggest bang, but, you know, will attract and interest people. So anyway, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a reader and an advertiser a long time uh -huh. in the Philadelphia Bar, so I'd like to go back to the beginning of what you had to say okay. and focus on your business. Uh -huh. Uh huh. Right. So I wonder what the future is going to be, and how the empire is going to keep ticking. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. In the next many years, which I think it does. Well, thank you, but it, it's a very good question. You know, of course, we gave the milk away for free, which is you've heard this before, and it, it was really unfortunate. And you know, one of the things we know from business school or business models is if you give somebody something free, you if you guess them, ask them to turn around and pay for it. They won't pay for it. We used to have free coffee in my office, and then they started charging, and guess what? People didn't take coffee at the office anymore. They went elsewhere, or they just brought it in. So you're right. And, and one of the things I worry about, and I've thought a lot about this, and not being a good business person. Look, if I was a good business person, I wouldn't be in journalism, right? Um, but um, one of the problems is that the technology people, the, bright, the brightest minds and the people who are making all this money in the Internet are generally engineers and visionaries, but they're not, con they're not content providers they're that they, they, you know they're the, the Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and the, to them content is ancillary they in fact they they can actually leech on content they've never been that interested in it and yet content is what moves most of the internet like the 10 most active sites I think other than Amazon and Amazon has content on it but I mean are really news providers they, they're people there are sites that give information so people want the information and and the my feeling is unfortunately the brightest minds didn't come to work in journalism because they saw that it was kind of in trouble you know, it was like in a coma. So they moved to other, you know, avenues. And we haven't gotten the best minds to come and work on this problem. Um, you know, one of the ironies is we keep depleting the staff and yet charging more money. To me, huh, I think that's a crappy business model. You know, I mean, how, how dare we raise prices and offer less? It's, it's not great. So I think a lot of things that we were doing, this is being recorded, isn't it? There's the camera may not be the smartest model. Now, they're trying this tablet. See, uh, I'm in a union. Um, they're, they're trying this tablet model, and, uh, you know, I don't know. Again, it's in its infancy. We're the first company. Uh, they're the first company to try this, to have people buy tablets for very little money and see. And the tablets have really been a boon for these websites. And the New Yorker, for example, charges a lot and have beautiful, beautiful. I mean, I want an iPad just to read their iPad, uh, you know, uh, another way I will never get anything done is be reading my iPad, but, but um, you know, beautiful tablet form um, journalism. And I think that this is going to explode on um, video and photography. But like I said, they don't know what, we're like, we're in the, we're in the, we're in the gutter right now. This, I, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, but, but yes, I don't know how they're going to fix it. And we need really smart, bright people. And, and right now we have, you know, investment funds, hedge funds who want to make money off of us. So they're motivated to make a profit. But I don't know where the, if the innovation is there yet. Do you know what I mean? People need to be invested and own a piece of something to want to change it, I think. But anyway. Um, yes. Oh, thank you. I'm not a misogynist, sexist. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm going to enjoy the moment. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, 
Well, I wrote about mummers and whores yesterday, if you saw my column. <laughs> it was just, I, I'm sorry, I just had to. I, I had so many jokes. I, I mean, I got to write a line that I have been dreaming of using my entire career, which is get thee to a mummery. I, I have just <laughs> dreamed of using that. And thank you, the downtowners, uh, Fancy Brigade, for giving me that. So, um, yes. <laughs> I did have, I had maybe too much fun, but yes, <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much, yes. I, I like to start with the restaurant. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, thank you. What, <laughs> do you. what do you think of Metropolis? Um, it's the kind of dystopian horror. That was the guy I was talking about. I don't know if he's getting a lot of readers. I think he does a really good job. I do like it. Metropolis, Tom Farrick. Uh huh. Uh -huh. It's a very good website. It's very good. I, again, I, you know, Tom, I think, got a lot more readers in, in the Inquirer. I mean, I think he's a terrific journalist, yeah. And it's a choice he made. He's a very good, he's a very good writer and reporter, yeah. And he loves the city. He's extremely passionate about the city. And he knows more about it than almost anyone. You know, it was a loss. Right. No, I'm afraid I don't because generally I spend most of my day, you know, doing research or, and then when I, when I take a break, I kind of really, like all of us, I take a break and I'll read the Times website or the New Yorker or uh, the uh, Gawker, <laughs> um, you know, or Slate or Politico. I mean, I take a break from what I'm doing. So I don't, I, and I, one of my big pet peeves is that I think that Philadelphians are too, um, insulated. <laughs> I think that people in Philadelphia think way too much about Philadelphia and don't have enough exposure to the rest of the world. And so I, um, my dream would be to send every Philadelphian like on a field trip for two years. I think they should all leave. And then they can come back because, because they think that everything, and I'm serious in a way, and particularly city council and the people in government, because they think that everything has always been this way and nothing should change because it's the status quo. And to me, you go other places and you see places that are doing things more differently, you know, differently and really innovatively, but you also see places that are worse, where the uh, patronage and the cronyism and, you know, somebody jokes about Chicago, even though Chicago's gotten a couple of really great mayors, um, you know, the, the al their aldermen make our city council people look like, huh, you know, amateur league. I mean, you know, if, if three or four aldermen don't go to prison every few years, I mean, the job's not done. So I, I think it's useful. I spend a lot of time reading about other, do you know what I mean? Um, so I, shall, I will look at that website, though. I always take suggestions. And I'm happy to do that. But I, I spend a lot of time not looking at, um, you know, read Dick's work. But I don't spend, like, all day on news works or philly.com because I get really depressed. See, now they're going to see that I just said that. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I think it's fine. I mean, I, I think at this point more has been written about um, Occupy wherever than has actually um, been accomplished. But I, I am not someone who's going to predict what the outcome of this is. A lot of people have decided that they know what, where this is going to end. And I don't think you do. I think when movements start, you know, you need to humble yourself. And, I, you know, I have an 18-year-old son who thinks he knows everything. And he said, uh, uh, and he said, oh, these kids are just they're idiots and they don't know what they're doing. And I said, but, you know, this, you know, Gandhi or Martin Luther King or, you know, you don't know. People start and people criticize them and, uh, you know, it may be over in a week or two and it may keep going and it may move. So I, my, my, I tried for the most part, to try to keep my mind open about this, that potentially this is the beginning of a movement and potentially this is a moment. And it's a moment that, fortunately or unfortunately, almost every journalist in America has felt compunction to write about. You know, that's another idea. I don't really like to be where everybody is. <laughs> I find like that saturation, if I go to an event and there are 400 reporters, I probably shouldn't be there. It's why I don't particularly like political conventions. Um, I don't think that's generally where you get the stories. I mean, I know we need to cover them, but um, I, I think that, um, you know, let other people do that. I, I'd rather be elsewhere. But I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, we've covered them a lot. Um, th I think this this city, by the way, has been incredibly enlightened and open-hearted about 
uh, these folks. It's been peaceful, which I think is the single most important thing, and it's been amicable um, so far. So far, so anyway. Yes? Uh huh. Right. Right. That's terrific. What's your site called? Okay. Good for you. Mm hmm. Right, right. Well, right. Well, I mean, in terms of the journalism, you know, side of it, I mean, to me, it's to, you know, take classes with, are you a student here? Okay, okay. Take student uh, classes with people like Dick, you know, who really know what they're doing. In terms of the business side, I always think this is one of the great things about being a journalist. It's like you get to be nosy. You should look at sites that you really admire, particularly if they're here and they're doing relatively well, and go talk to the business people there. Because, again, if I knew what I was doing, you know, I, I'm not a business person. So, to me, again, a large part of this business is humility, is understanding what you don't know. I, I'm always wary when we've brought in reporters in the past who acted like they knew everything and yet they were new to a beat. Those are reporters that always make the most mistakes. To me, you have this complete advantage of saying, you know what, I'm new. You just were honest about it. And go, and you know, most people like to be teachers, particularly with young people, I think. And, and to say, um, you know, yeah, I'd be happy to take you on. You know, the other thing is when the summer comes or break comes, you could ask if you could go for a couple days and again, it's not any money, but, but to intern to watch how they do it. But I would both be hooking up with people like Dick who know the journalism side and particularly because Dick like knows politics better than anybody in the city and then also to talk to people who really seem to be knowing what they're doing with with websites you know I think one of the most important things with a good website is is great design I think a lot of websites look terrible again we'll go back to CNN I've never seen anything that's worse designed than CNN so uh, again you know to be clean to be clear to have your your visual product uh, reflect your mindset but I think what an exciting, great thing you're doing. That's terrific. And, and, and really never be afraid to ask the questions because you don't want to make mistakes. The way you're going to get legitimacy is to really ask questions, to really do your research, and never assume, if you don't know anything, go, you know, go find out. But good for you. Good for you. Yes, you've been asking. Yeah. Oh, I get paid every week, no matter what. Oh, no, except on furlough, I don't get paid. <laughs> we now have these things called furlough where we don't get paid. I just had one. But uh, we get paid every week. So if you write five stories, if you write one story, if you write no stories, we get paid every week. No, you mean the website? Oh, web. People are just reading online, not reading the newspaper. Yes. How do I get paid? Who's paying the journalists? Um, well, the, the publishers pay. I mean, the company pays us no matter what, but you know there are ads on our website. You have to charge a lot less on the web because people are there for just seconds. I mean, they've done research on this. But some of those ads will follow you. So we're getting more and more ads on the web. There's information. They've got people signing up for this dealio thing, which is a kind of a Groupon you know, discounter. So the more that they get, the more eyeballs, just like um, with print, we can charge more for advertising, allegedly, if we have more readers. And unfortunately, our print circulation is going down, so our ad rates should be going down. They're probably not. But, um, but, but on the web, they're going up. It was very important for them to hit that 100 million mark. That's apparently one of those uh, crucibles in, in, in online traffic. But that's one of the ways that they are making more money, and they will continue to make more money. I mean, our website, I don't think, will ever not have heavy traffic. Again, because of the Flyers, and the Phillies, and the Eagles, and the soccer team, and every other sports team. So, so yes, increasingly there will be money made, and then now they've got these tablets. So it's not per se, oh, that check goes to Karen, but they're trying to create revenue, and, and they're working on even more uh, revenue streams. The idea is to have these apps that people have to pay for, their phone apps, their uh, uh, iPad, you know, tablet apps, um, and there'll be even more. My, my, I would not be surprised if eventually there's a real television component to it, um, you know, video through computers, and um, there'll be more of that, even more. We're hiring producers uh, uh, to uh, produce content on health, entertainment, um, uh, sports, uh, Oh, there are five of them. I can't remember. Uh, news and I forget. Uh, 
entertainment, I said entertainment, style. So th there are these producers that's supposed to attract advertising. We have a lot of health advertisers here. So that's one of the things we're doing. Any other questions? Yes. Just uh, one quick question, a uh, personal question, and a question about your work. Uh, just as a matter of fact, do you live in the city? I do live in the, I'm the only columnist at the paper who lives in the city. I wait. No, no, no. Trudy lives in the Trudy lives in the city, but she doesn't write about the city. But I'm the only metro columnist. There are five of us who lives in the city. Okay. Uh, the question I had about your work is that do you ever find your editor trying to put a check on you? For example, I think of to me the most explosive article you ever wrote was about public television giving a tour. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can see an editor saying, you know, it's a great article and you're dead on about this, but you know, public television is a good thing. And if you publish this article, it's going to Um, the only, no, I never get that kind of pressure. Um, um, I don't know if you know what I wrote about, but just to give you background, um, uh, one of my bugaboos is the people who are overpaid for their work. And uh, the head of HYY, and I, I, am, I, you, I love Radio Times, and, I, um, and I've been on it <laughs> several times, and, I, and, and Terry Gross is a friend, and, um, and I love Fresh Air, and I listen to them all the time, but I, I am appalled at how much money. At one point, he was making $700,000 a year um, through um, income, uh, pension payouts. They, they even paid him um, like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 one time, three times, it said one time on the thing, to um, help with his tax uh, burden when he cashes out his pension. I mean, wouldn't we all like that? So I wrote about it, and I was just appalled, and I felt that that was... Um, that was useful to people to know that when you give to HYY, I know how poorly a lot of those people are paid. And, and you know, they've laid off so many people, they're not even providing, they create no original television programming. And they don't have a television studio in that building. They built a new building and there's no television studio. And so, yes, I got a lot of grief about it, but uh, no one told me to stop. And when editors say, is, you know, this is libelous, or they'll say, you know, do you have the facts? I want an editor to question that. I want an editor to say, do you have to, you know, do you have the information in my back? And you know, or do you know what, now I didn't get actually as much backlash from them. They're very unhappy. He, he has come, he never has complained to me, which shows you what kind of a person he is. He's complained only to my bosses. But we have continued to write about this, and he had, did actually take a pay cut. He's still making an enormous amount of money, but he's not making 700000 He's making more like 400000 But he still makes more, he makes, still makes more than the President of the United States. I happen to think that's a hard job. So, um, <laughs> And I will tell you, and I don't want to brag, but I will, that I am the person who uh, a year ago questioned how much Carl Green was making. Because Carl Green, the head of the Philadelphia Housing Authority, was making more than the Secretary of Housing for the nation. And that is what began to have all of the people who worked for him come out of the woodwork and share information with us about how badly run that organization was. Well, that came out too. I mean, because I just dared to ask, why does this man make so much money? So, so do you know what I mean? I think that's what we're supposed to do. And if we don't do it, who will? So, you know, I don't know. Yes? Well, I, I, well, unfortunately, I, I, I see your point, but on the first point, I have to say that's the free market system. It's always been unfair, and it will continue to be unfair. And no matter what people protest, only if the board of directors or the consciousness of the, the CEO themselves decides to take less. I mean, the problem is, part of it is these boards. I mean, that's how both Bill Morazzo and Carl Green were so ridiculously overpaid, is that their boards just rubber stamp them. And yet, being on a board is hard work, and you generally are not compensated. You're certainly not compensated for public or nonprofit. You are compensated for a for-profit company, and there becomes the whole rub. You're getting a lot of money from these companies, and in turn, the job of the CEO is to make money at any cost. And Often the cost is the employees or farming out jobs. So do you know what I mean? That, that is the, both the beauty and the problem with the free market system. We have no cap on what these people can make. But we can call into question what people in the public sector and what non you know, I, you know, frankly, Brian Roberts at Comcast can be paid whatever he wants. And you, know, you don't have to use Comcast if you don't want to. We now, fortunately, can, there are some other choices or used not to be. 
<laughs> we, th now there should be a choice. I mean, there's Vios, and, and not that that's so great, but, but there are other forms now. It used to be a monopoly. But at least on the public stuff, um, I, I think that's partly our job. And I don't think we're probably doing it enough, you know? Anyone else? Um, I have one, I have yeah. one question. <laughs> one last question. Um, okay, so a good column, you know, if you just read it, the reader reads it quickly, right? Just a couple minutes, really, two or three minutes. A reader can just zip right through it if it's done well. How long does it take you, typically, how long does it take you when you sit down with all your notes to write it? Oh, and, and this is like so embarrassing. Um, I will go right up to the deadline. So Are talking <laughs> hours? Hours and hours. And sometimes I go, how did I spend hours on that? I'm not, I, it, I will just take the time. I, I mean, I know other people will write in, in an hour. I don't tend to do that. And I probably would do better to write that quickly, but I will, I will generally use up all available time, or I'll, if I, the best of all possible worlds is I, I, I sort of take it, which I did with the mummers thing, because it was humor, and humor has to be very fine-tuned, and it looks easy, and it's very hard, and you, so I, I wrote it, and I, I fortunately wrote it on Thursday, and then I got to walk away from it, and then Friday morning, I spent another three hours just like literally fine-tuning it, but I'm writing my column now for Wednesday, and I spent an hour just on the first three paragraphs because my feeling is, and I, I, when I see a cliche, I went, oh, that's a cliche, I have to, because um, I need to get you to read it. So I will fine tune it and fine tune it and fine tune it so that the sentence is a little different, that it's elegant, that it's reflective of the subject, if it's funny and it needs to be short, tight, and punchy, if this is a very sad story and very moving story, I need to be more, um, the prose needs to sort of linger and catch you. So I really try to tailor it. So I, I'm embarrassed to say it takes a far longer than anybody thinks it should, but <laughs> including my editor. But, um, but I do, I never break deadlines, but I will often go right up to that line. So um, yeah. <laughs> and then, then people spend a minute on it, they read the first paragraph and they go, I'm not interested, and they leave. You know? Well, that's, uh, that, uh, that actually just sets up my last comment because I'm speaking also as a former Metro columnist from years ago. Uh, I used to get asked, I used to write three a week. And uh, I used to get asked, uh, well, they'd say, how many do you write a week? And I'd say three. And then the response was always, well, what do you do the other two days? <laughs> so, I don't know, let's, let's give Karen a hand for the labor. Okay. And if, uh, if you have a couple of minutes, you may want to have people yeah. linger. <laughs> um, and I hope to see you guys uh, in Thank November. Thank you for coming out. Thank you so much. Hot. It gets hot. Oh, my God. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you for coming. Thanks for coming again. Uh, okay, the one with the ball is down. She's nuts, too. And then I want to say something to you privately. Hi, I'm Joy.